Okay, welcome back. Uh, Prince has posted a question here. Uh, that, uh, can it be taught or should it be caught? Meaning, you know, is, there, is it something that you can learn or every, anybody can learn? Or is it something that needs to be, you know, observed and therefore practiced, right? It's something that you not necessarily you know, learn, but it's something that you observe and then you just receive kind of thing. So, um, well, the uh, response to that is that, yes, it can be taught. Okay. So, um, leading a worship, you know, it's a, it's, it's both, you know, an art and also something to, that comes from your heart in the, you know, because we know worship is a response, right? When you look at worship itself, worship is a response. Um, several things, you know, it's a recognition of who God is. It's a response to uh, our encounter with God, um, uh, admiration of God, and so on. So it's it's a response, right? So uh, so how can you teach somebody to respond in the right manner, right? So that could be a question. Right? So while worship is a response to God, so it's it's more of a oh, it's, Thing is, just one sec. Um, Chira, just see. I think Nelson, no? Uh, who, who's the boy? Uh, Boaz. Boaz. Okay. I think they just went out. Just see if it's uh, they require help. Okay. Um, yeah, he's going. It's here only. Uh, sorry, um, someone is unwell here. So, yeah. Um, Okay, so the, so the thing is that uh, well, worship itself is uh, you know it's it's something to do with the heart. So how can you you know the question is how can you teach somebody to respond in the right manner and so on, right? So um, well, yes, when you your response to worship, your encounter, your, you know your uh, um, uh, response to an encounter with God, that cannot be something that can be manufactured, right? So that is something that is. That is truly, you know, spontaneous. It comes from you. It comes from our relationship with God. It comes from our closeness with God, and so on. So, so that that is there. However, we can inst it's in it, and it's also a spiritual act, right? It's uh, you know, the Lord Jesus said, "You worship in spirit and in truth." So, it's something that in involves our spirit and something that is led by the spirit. So, it's a spiritual act of worship. While it is so, like all other spiritual things right uh, or spiritual disciplines this is also something that people can be instructed in and something that you can be trained in right but the first aspect the relational aspect is very important right? and the relational aspect which leads to an encounter and the response to that encounter that's that's the foundational thing right um and what is that aspect that can be taught? Well, instructions on how not to hinder, instructions on how to encourage, instructions on how to facilitate. You know, these are some things that definitely one can learn, right? One can be taught. Right? So that's that's the thing. What are some aspects which are you know which you observe and you receive? Well, definitely. Yeah, uh, you know, spiritually, uh, we we come to the encounter with God and and all that. Though that the relational aspect of it, which we uh, which we experience on our own, but the other things uh, definitely can be instructed and taught. Okay. Um, this it's a skill, right? It's a skill which we grow in. So you understand, okay, here are some things that actually help people. Here are some things that I should not do. Here are some things that can take take people deeper. Uh, in worship and so on. So, yeah. So I would say uh, that I, I would just answer it that way, right? Um, also, uh, just to add on to that is, um, uh, so all of us are worshippers, right? All of us are worshippers because all human beings, whether irrespective of whether is a person is a believer or not. Is a worshiper because the fact is that we are created to worship. We are created to be in awe of um, of some uh, some someone or something, and yield ourselves, surrender ourselves to it. You know, even an atheist, 
is is a worshipper because he or she has instead of God there is someone else, something else in place, right? So everyone worships. So that is how we are created. So the thing is this: as believers, all of us are worshippers, worshippers in spirit and truth. But not all of us are called to minister in worship. So that's the distinction, right? So when we say leading worship, we're saying okay, ministering in worship. Not all of us are are called or anointed for that. So, so that is something that I need to understand, right? Uh, if I am having some basic skills, natural abilities, and uh, definitely I can grow in this skill, right? grow in this ability. Right? Does that help, uh, Prince? Any other questions? Um, okay, fine. Right. Okay, so let's uh, let's move on. Um, Yeah. Sorry, sorry, what can, can they have? Tattoos. Yeah. Hmm. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Tattoos, piercings, um, whatever, um, and a body piercing, etc. Now, um, okay, that, that's a yeah. I'll just repeat the question. So, Sri Radha's question is okay uh, about tattoos and piercing, body piercings, and all that. So, someone who's uh, you know a, who's leading worship uh, has that, and then you know someone who comes to uh, maybe a new believer or you know someone who's new in the Lord. Um, comes to you know comes to that place, not really with an intention of you know ha having tattoos or whatever, but then they get influenced seeing this. So, is it okay? Is it good? Is it bad? Kind of a you know that's that was the question. So, so the thing is this you know when it comes to tattoos and body piercings, um, well, it has a religious connotation, right? We see, um, you know, uh, in in right in the Old Testament also we see that they, this was done as a as a religious ritual, right? At the same time, we know that it it need not have a religious ritual also. Right? Then it also has some health implications because you are actually piercing the skin and you are injecting a dye which goes below the surface. It it has uh, you know some reactions uh, to the to the whole thing and then skin reactions. Uh, it has some uh, you know uh, health connotation also. So these are some things to bear in mind. Right, so, but majority of people who do it don't do it as a religious act or in surrendering to some deity, but they do it as a cosmetic thing, right? And there's a healthy, safe way of doing it, hygienic way of doing it, and you know, like infected needles and so on. So that's the thing. So with that in mind, there are you know certain cultures, certain places where piercing is like total taboo right and and maybe even wearing jeans is taboo you <laughs> know it's it's like that right and jeans is taboo and the thing you know if you uh, so there are many things that are taboo for such you know such a thing so uh, the bigger picture is am i being a stumbling block or am i really helping this person so that's the only thing Right now, once you once you put a tattoo, you can't erase it. You can only modify, try to hide it, or whatever. Uh, so that's the reality of it. So uh, you know, when you're maybe as a worship leader, you have a tattoo and you're leading and all that. People get influenced by it, and they also, you know, maybe they think, hey, that's a very cool idea. Maybe I, I'll also do it. It's fine, <laughs> but the only thing is, you know, uh, yeah. How are you? How's your life example? You know that's the bigger thing, bigger thing, and are you being a stumbling block to their faith? You know, maybe they get drawn into other things rather than just tattoos and body, you know, body piercing. They into a lifestyle that 
you know uh, which takes people away from the lord in terms of leisure in terms of entertainment whatever then it becomes a then it becomes a problem so otherwise you know if you look at tattooing by itself uh, i don't think it's a problem but you have to consider so many other things culture etc and see where has god placed you you know do you really want to do this in order to help the person let's say you know you you're ministering in a place where uh, well they and you're ministering to people who are just coming from the hindu background and you know they're all maybe vegetarians you know and there's no point in you having you know uh, even though you might like beef you know there's no point in you cooking beef at home or something that you forego right? because you're having people over and they're all coming from a you know hindu background and they, for them it's like you know blasphemy sex sacrilege it makes them uncomfortable so why why do you do that it's better to avoid so so things like that so that's why paul also says right paul says that you know i don't want to do, do not destroy something do not destroy the faith of a person for which uh, you know god do not destroy with food for which uh, god you know Die, for which the lord jesus died on the cross uh, don't don't destroy it food so so these are things that we need to be you know uh, mindful of so that's the thing right okay any other questions lifestyle of worship leaders <laughs> yeah i've been listening to a lot of uh, podcasts actually about uh, this whole thing of uh, you know coming back to the heart of worship and um you know how worship music has become a genre by itself uh having a certain lifestyle almost a celebrity status right and uh, and how we need to be careful and right? while we want the reach Uh, we want music to reach people we want music to bless people i mean music as in say songs to be a blessing to the church um how not to get sucked into you know these kind of things right? so yeah we have all these uh, challenges that are there today in today's ministry right okay okay let's uh, let's look at uh, uh, some more things like right? we are we're looking at uh, like the frequency right Now, when it comes to um, some of these tasks or responsibilities these are things that we do maybe on a daily basis monthly basis so we looked at planning you know the songs and planning for the entire year based on what the church is going to be focusing on okay the other thing is um uh, for the worship people who are in worship ministry you know, to be um uh to be engaging in all the other okay maybe we should just put it this way they should engage in the life of the church okay and not just um relegate or not just focus on just one aspect you know this is where they serve yes this is where they are skilled this is where they are anointed but you know if you look at the wider aspect of the church or the pastoral work of the church you know from from a uh, a person who is part of a worship ministry we can say that you know well they need to be engaged in the life of the church maybe it is a you know uh, other things like prayer maybe it's uh, uh, you know so many other things that the church is involved in maybe missions right so someone who is in worship ministry should not exclude themselves but really be engaged in the life of the church now we know we have all of us have limited time right there's only 24 hours in a day so but the fact is things like fellowship missions evangelism and all that is is a person who's involved in worship ministry can needs to be part of the general life of the church right as far as the leadership goes you know to also be involved in the pastoral work of the church you know it could be counseling it could be uh, visits right it could be certain things that are happening like bereavement and funerals and so on um to be to be involved okay so uh, to or to oversee certain of uh, certain responsibilities like this which come up uh, so um, that is also you know the way you share the lord it is also important right um 
but also the, the thing is to say that you know if your primary responsibility as a worship minister or a worship pastor you know, if that is your primary responsibility which means that's the main thing that you've been called to do and if the other responsibilities are actually hampering hindering right um, this particular main thing then we need to have a discussion with the leaders discussion with the leader and say okay i need to maybe let go of some of these other responsibilities or i can't look into these other responsibilities because my primary responsibility itself is suffering right so while we need to share in the other work pastoral work of the church uh, we need to make sure that the primary responsibility is fulfilled right so that's the main thing okay then um then the task for the worship minister or the worship uh, okay um yeah uh, nina is saying there's something against piercing or tattoos in the old testament did it mean something else no it's it's exactly this about piercing and tattoos in i think it's in devitic case i'm also not sure of the reference exact reference but the fact is again uh, it was in line with the, the worship of other deities right it's not piercing per se or tattoos just tattoo the act of tattooing but it what it involved what it actually represented to that culture uh, to the you know the the land in which this uh, israelites were going into um so that was the prevailing practice or the ritual that was there so in line with that uh, the lord want, wants and yeah, so that's the thing uh, I, i'm also not sure of the reference we can actually sorry look levitic is 19 no okay moral and ceremonial laws um anyway um 1928 yeah okay yeah so it says here you know do not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead uh nor tattoo any marks on you i am the lord so you know it is on maybe there was a worship of uh you know the spirits of people who have you know died so so the lord is you know really against that no mar- marks in your um body etc Um, for uh, for the sake of that so so that's the context in which he is uh, saying that so yeah okay uh, so yeah so your question is okay does it have any in- significance today so see there are some ritualistic piercings right like some of these tribes uh, they have it as an ancestor worship they do it as a you know as a worship to certain uh, Uh, ancestral spirits and so on even their piercing it it has a it has a certain uh, you know it is done uh, 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 as an act towards that so then so those are things that you don't you don't want to do you do, you want to avoid right and obviously nobody you know does that maybe if somebody is coming from that culture and you know they become a believer and uh, you know then they they need to understand you know what is this what is this whole thing signify right but what for today um whatever tattooing whatever things that we see piercings it's it's well it's uh, it doesn't have a significance right uh, you consider the health of it whether it's healthy you consider the hygiene aspect of it and uh, you consider the uh, you know the weaker brother syndrome you know is it going to is it going to help the person is it going to edify the person is it going to uh, so these are things that for we we consider before actually you know going ahead with it right yeah yeah and also the whole thing of uh, you know why are you doing it right is it because you want to draw attention to yourself you know that's the other thing right um, draw attention to yourself uh, uh, so that's something to see you know is it um, you are you are very insecure about how you look and what you do so that you want to you know s- draw attention to that uh, you want to you know kind of elevate yourself in in such a manner 
So all these things, rather than you know just that act itself, these are things to consider and reflect, uh, and then see if you really want to do it. Right. Okay. Okay. So let's um, yeah let's look at the other task. Other task is also you know uh, to increase in our skills and abilities. You know it could be something to do directly with the act of leading worship, like maybe a musical skill, maybe a singing ability, right? So we see that um, the skill part of it is something that's, that's over and over again. You know, even if we see in the tabernacle, we studied that, we saw that they were skilled, right? They would be taught, they were instructed. Um, so the skill is not something that is unspiritual. Psalm 33, 3. That verse we've seen, play to him a new song, uh, sorry, sing to him a new song, play skillfully with a shout of joy. So skill um, is also, it's a, it's a relative word, right? So in the sense, uh, your level of skill, well, it could always grow, right? You are at a certain level and next year, you know, you can actually, if you intentionally work on it, it can be at a higher level. So it's a very relative thing when you say I'm skilled in some things, right? So, um, so one needs to grow, you know. So don't hold back from increasing in skill. And um, you know, as someone, particularly if you are called to lead in worship, uh, being a lead worshiper, you know, worship leader, then this skill, musical skill, actually helps, right? How? Because you are able to. It becomes second nature. Like playing an instrument becomes a second nature where you're not consciously thinking about it. And you're able to, you know, it facilitates you to focus on the Lord and really minister, lead in worship rather than thinking about, okay, what should I play next? Or, you know, how should I play this chord? Or how should I, you know, it just releases you. It just gives you that liberty and freedom. And also, you don't play wrong in order to hinder. Like for example, you know, uh, I remember this happened in uh, it actually happened in a church uh, service where this person who was actually leading worship, he did not tune the instrument, right? So he went, he did not tune the guitar, and one, I think, a couple of strings were out of tune, and I don't know whether he, he realized it or not, but he just went through the whole service having the guitar not in tune. Right? So there was another person who was there who was a musician. And that person found it highly distracting. Right? Well, we can say, hey, you're not supposed to be, you know, you're supposed to overlook it and you know focus on the Lord. True. Yeah. You can overlook it. But the person, but the thing is that it became a hindrance for that person, right? He because he was a musician, he just couldn't bear the fact that an instrument was not tuned. And it also kind of, you know, kind of um, communicated this message that this person was not really excellent. They did not really care about the small, basic things before ministry. He took it for granted. Right? Uh, it might have been a genuine mistake, but it doesn't take too long to stop and then tune the instrument and you know, or at, at least in between songs do it. So things like this. Right now, this is at a very basic skill level, but then you know, things like tuning, hindrance. If you play wrong, it's a hindrance. Or if you, you know, so when we increase in skill, it's not just, oh, look how great I'm playing or see how well I'm singing. No, it is actually something that liberates us where we can focus on the Lord. So that's what we, you know, we tell the team over and over again, you know, like, uh, you know, learn it, learn the songs well, um, or, you know, learn to play well. And increase, uh, you know, practice well, so that it becomes part of you, and you don't. You can actually focus on worshiping the Lord. So that is the intention. That is the heart behind it. And you want to offer something that is, you know, that is not, you know, that is that costs you something. You know, like David says, you know, I will not offer unto the Lord something that does not cost me anything. Right? So, yes, this practice, this increasing in skill. It, it's an investment in time, right? But it is something that enables us, right? That is skill, music level, musical ability. The other thing is also leadership. 
uh, how we actually shepherd the people, right? how we lead the team, how we uh, nurture the team and so on, you know, different things about resolving conflicts, um, inspiring the team, casting the vision, um, taking, you know, maybe problem solving and all that, we can always learn, right? So that is another, that is another thing that we can grow in, in, in increasing in our leadership ability and skill, right? So these are some things that are continuous and ongoing for us as, you know, as a person who's overseeing the worship ministry, okay? Um, any questions here? Right. We look. We so we looked at what are some things that are frequent, repetitive. These are these tasks. Like right? rather, I mean, uh, we started with scheduling and went through the list of uh, six or seven things that are uh, that are important, that are necessary, and you can't do away with. Right? Okay. Um, let's look at some uh, organizational aspect. Of worship ministry. Okay. So when we say organizational worship, how are we, how are we planned, how are we organized as a ministry, as a team, um, to minister in worship? Okay. Now we know at, at, at the very core level, at as as a simple level, there could be just one person, okay, one person who is leading. That's it. It's very simple. That person can actually choose the songs on Sunday morning also. And uh, you know, think of what to share, what to sing, what to do, and that's fine. But the more people you add to the team, it becomes, it increases in complexity. If you had just one more person, that means that there needs to be a time where they meet and run through, or at least practice together what needs to be done. So that is only give the that will only give them the common idea. Okay, this is this is where we are going. Okay, what are some things that we're going to do? There could be times when okay, you don't have an opportunity to do that. You know, maybe you're busy, uh, maybe some emergencies, and uh, so um, you know you don't have an opportunity to get together. That's fine, but that should not become the norm. No, that should not become a habit. And like we always say, you know, you need to gather together. You need to become uh, you need to practice together. Okay? So uh, while we also, you know, emphasize on spontaneous worship and prophetic worship and so on, um, that comes with increase in skill, personal skill level, right? Um, and uh, practicing together as a team is very, very important. So, so the team, right? So it's not just one person. As you grow, you see that the more people added and added to the team. Right. So it's like one simple exercise we did in one of the worship team, um, I think, meetings many years ago. It's like, um, okay, so as as one as a single person, if you're just walking around, you can do what you want. You, know, you can do a cartwheel, you can jump, you can run when you want, you can stop when you want, right? And you just go. Then what we did was we tied the legs of two people, right? So there were three, six people, two, two, they were tied. And now we said, okay, now you run. Now we give some, you know, uh, this is what you need to do. You run, you stop, you jump, you do it. But you need to do it well. Okay, so then you realize that, hey, I need to communicate. I need to say, okay, now I have to jump over this chair. Now I have to go around this. Now I have to, you know, uh, maybe just jump. And now I have to run. It requires some effort, some coordination. Then we tied three people together, right? So I tied the legs of three people, and then also in batches of three, and they said, okay, do the same thing. Now it required even more effort, even more coordination, even more planning. So, so that's the thing. Worship ministry, worship leading, we are a team, right? We are a team doing different things. And add to it all these different instruments, all these different musical instruments, each has its own complexity. Each has its own way of, you know, where, where to be played and so on. Where to play, when to play, where to stop, when not to, you know, uh, um, stop, etc. So we need to, we understand the power of the team. We understand the effectiveness of the team. 
uh, and the Lord wants us to minister, you know, as a team. Right? So there are many benefits that happen as a team, but with the team also comes the complexity of ministering as a team, right? Okay, so um, okay, uh, I'm just showing that picture which is there in the notes. You can follow in the notes also if you have. Okay, it's page forty. You will see that uh, you know this could be a ideal structure. Okay, now we know that you know there are different kinds of churches, house churches, um, you know churches in the city, urban churches, rural churches, etc. So it's not just a one one plan. You know that um, one model, and you're saying, okay, this is how it needs to be. No, it's not that. It's just a you know this is a, a organization structure for an urban church. For a church which has a you know, big team, this would work, right? So you have the the senior pastor, who's the pastor of the church, who's a you know who's, um, uh, whom God has envisioned to do the work of ministry. So we have the you know under that would come the worship pastor and also what we could call as a chief musician or you know somebody who's skilled in music, okay, um, and not necessarily a worship. Not necessarily in, in worship, leading in worship, but somebody who understands music um, really better and skilled in music. Okay. Then we have the band, right? So people who play the music. So the left extreme is the band, people who are musicians. Um, then the right extreme, we have the singers, right? People who sing. And we know we could have a mix of people who both play instruments and sing as well. Okay. So that so we have that. Then we have the sound team, meaning people who take care of the audio uh, of the uh, of the church, like sound sound equipment um, to handle the sound. Meaning, okay, uh, they know the functioning of it, and they know how to get the best out of it, right? So now this audio system has come to be a very important part of any ministry. Right? It can make or break. I've been in, you know, especially in weddings where the cordless would not work. Till the sound check, it would have worked. And they start the service and then there's some problem with the audio and the person who's sitting there does not know how to control it and there's feedback, constant feedback and, and it becomes, you know, such a bad experience. And especially for the, you know, for the for the couple, you know, they just, uh, and the families and it's a wedding and then you know, the whole thing becomes a, such a uh, such a pain, right? Um, and such a uh, such a thing that could have been avoided with better planning. So the so the audio system is very important, especially for big gatherings, um, and uh, and especially when you have you know um, uh, a lot of music instruments which are electronic in nature, which needs to be plugged in, which needs to be amplified. So so a sound team having a good sound team is is really a, uh, it's 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 really a gift, right? Then. You know, having a media team or a media person. Now, when you say team, yes, it could be just one person sometimes or just two people, right? Uh, and having a, someone who is gifted in or skilled in the media side of things, you know, when it comes to uh, maybe visuals, projection, streaming, right? Um, that has also become part of it. It has also become a norm, right? Right from, the, I think, COVID times, church could be very small. But they are streaming the service, right? They are they and uh, what equipment are they using? One one cell phone, one mobile phone, like maybe Facebook Live or on Zoom. They are streaming the service, so it has become it has become a norm. You know, they ask, okay, do we have live stream link? Right? Any particular, you know, even a wedding or a, you know any kind of thing, they ask, is there a link that we can check? So that has also become a norm, right? So, um, so someone who can handle that, so that is. That is also part of it. Then we have, you know, the congregation and so on. So this could be a, this could be a structure to develop, right? This could be a structure where you say, okay, uh, I need to have this in place. I need to have, you know, I need, I have these musicians and singers who are part of the team, but then I need some technical people. Uh, I need them in place, right, for for the Sunday services and and for the church ministry itself, right? Um, okay. So, the, so when we look at the uh, role of the pastor, okay, we saw right at the beginning, you know, the pastor. Many times we think that okay, as worship 
ministry, maybe the worship pastor heads the ministry. Right? Technically, yes, right? The role and responsibility uh, it, it it lies with the worship pastor, right? And the daily functioning, the monthly functioning, the yearly planning, it lies with the worship pastor. But we need to understand that the senior pastor is ultimately um, he, he's the one who has the the vision for the church, or he's the vision one who casts the vision for the church and the ministry, right? So, so we need to understand that the senior pastor is actually the worship leader, right? So, as a uh, as a senior pastor, so he's the one who's responsible to God, accountable to God, and uh, you know, he's providing the vision and uh, uh, the direction of the ministry, the direction of the church, the goals and everything. It comes from the senior pastor. Right? So the worship pastor works with the senior pastor. Um, so it, it puts a lot of, um, you know, the, the, the task of the senior pastor, the responsibility of the senior pastor is very important. Right? Because the worship pastor can actually have a very differing vision of how worship should be, of how church should be, and it will become a clash. Right? So we've had problems where there was a very, you know, there was a gap, not between the senior pastor and the worship pastor, but there was a gap between the worship pastor and the worship team members. Right? Well, the vision was very clear in the worship pastor's mind, but for the team members, the vision was not clear at all, or it was a different vision. Right? Oh, this is how church should be. This is how worship should be, and so on. So the whole thing it became a it became a problem. Right? It's as simple as you know you're saying that okay today we are going we are going to uh, after classes we are going to this place place A wherever it is we are meeting there. So that's the thing. So you as a you know as a student you have that. But then, if the principal has another picture in mind, saying, okay, they're not going to place A, but you're going to place B. It's as simple as that, right? So, so it's very clear in the principal's mind that you're going to place B. But then if for you, you, you feel or you sense that, okay, place A is where I need to go. It becomes a conflict. It becomes a clash. And nobody is going anywhere. You know, there's no... There's no progress made with such a vision in mind. Similar thing happens. Right? So um, for the worship pastor and the senior pastor you know, to work together, like to have the same vision. So the worship pastor, sorry, the senior pastor provides a vision, the direction, and that needs to be communicated. Uh, and worship pastor, you know, needs to work with that. Right? Okay. So. Um, so yeah, so the role of the senior pastor is very important. Um, key to the worship ministry must be an example of a worshiper before the congregation, right? So, so a person, a senior pastor who's a worshiper, will give rise to a generation in the church who will be worshippers. You know, I don't know if you've noticed. You know, some sometimes in meetings, um, like the speaker will come. And the speaker is not really interested in worship, or maybe, you know, the main, they they come late, right? And when the worship uh, time is happening, they are talking to others. You know, they're just talking, or maybe they're checking their phone. They're talking on the phone, right? So everybody's looking, right? The church is looking. They are saying, okay, what is the pastor doing? So they're learning something. What are they learning? That hey, this is not an important thing. It's not an important thing. Because the pastor doesn't seem to give it importance, therefore it need not be important. Maybe it's not important. Right? The pastor is checking the phone. The pastor is maybe you know doing other things, just sitting and talking. Or, so maybe it's not important. So you're communicating something to the congregation. So, but if the pastor, if the senior pastor is engaged, is involved, right, is there on time. Uh, to take part, actively involved in worship, then the congregation understands, hey, this is not just singing, but it's engaging with God in worship. So something that's of value, this is important, 
something that I should not compromise with, maybe, right? So from time to time, you realize the congregation actually glances at the worship pastor, at the senior pastor. You know, they're just looking to him. Okay, how does this person consider this? How does this? What does this person think of this? Right? So we need to uh, we need to understand that it's a very important role. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, you have a question. Okay. Regarding the guest speaker, Pastor. Regarding the guest speaker. Guest okay. speaker. So, like, I saw a lot, lot of time, like, there are three categories. Like, one person will come, like, sit behind of the stage. Like, they won't come at right time. And some person will come sit in congregation. And some pastors will ask, like, this, okay, like, what is the worship team, worship uh, time, and what time I should come? So, like, can we make a, like, rule like this, like, the pastor also should to be part of worship? Is it, like, mandatory? We can say that to, like, the speaker or anything like that. Yeah, for the guest speakers, we can, uh, it becomes a little, uh, you know, uh, because they are guests. Uh, so, you can actually give a guideline. And you can say, you know, we'd like you to be part of the service. And this is the, uh, you know, we started this and please come. Or you pick them up. Maybe somebody is assigned to pick them up from wherever they are staying and you're bringing it. Tell them, you know, we'll come at this time and we will uh, go to church at this particular time. This is time we are starting. And then, so you tell them, you know, so we, which means that when they ask such questions, like what time should we be there? And all that, we say that this time, you know, it's, it's uh, nine o'clock. So nine o'clock, you know, so. So they also uh, get involved. So, but the, what they do during the time, we can't control. Right? They might be speaking. They might be. So that's the thing. But over a period of time, they also realize that, hey, this is, uh, this is something that is important. This is the culture of the leadership. And so let me respect it. You know? So that's the thing. Yeah. Um, so that's the way to do it. Yeah. Um, but for us, as maybe we are pastors, uh, we we have to be uh, careful um, not to send a message. Uh, you know, careful in the sense we need to first of all, you know, ensure that we are worshippers, right? We are worshiping. We are worshippers. We're not we're not delegating this responsibility to something. You know, or you know, we are not esteeming it lesser than in priority than any in a, than you know maybe the word and all that. So um, that is something that we need to check. Another thing that we see is that, uh, let's say, a worship leader says, um, "Okay, why don't we lift our hands and worship?" You know, people will will also, you know, subconsciously look at the leaders, look at the pastor, and say, "Is he lifting his hands?" Right? The worship leader is saying, "Okay, lift your hands and let's sing, or maybe let's kneel down and all that." But is that person doing it? Right? So they will look at it. So we we'll, are we leading by example? It could be any expression in worship, maybe. Clapping of hands, or shouting, or lifting of hands, uh, any expression, you know, dance or whatever. So, the senior pastor has a lot of influence on the congregation. So, one needs to lead by example. So, um, if you are the senior pastor, then you know, you, we are the senior pastor. We, you and I, you know, we need to lead by example, or any anybody, you know, any any pastoral. Uh, any leadership capacity, we need to lead by example. Right? So, what what other role does the uh, you know? Uh, first of all, okay, he provides vision. Uh, he, he leads by example. The third one is also to um, to teach the congregation on worship. See, worship. Um, not not many churches teach on worship, right? What does it accomplish? Why do we do this? Why do we worship? How can we worship? Is worship about singing? You know, whatever we are learning in the course, um, well, it is the responsibility of the pastor to teach to the congregation. So, at some point, you know, we may not teach every Sunday. You know, maybe, maybe at some point, uh, or you know, uh, we we need to give that emphasis, uh, or maybe some kind of training, something. You know. Uh, to teach to the to teach the congregation the importance of worship, so that responsibility lies with the with the pastor. Okay. Now, when we look at the worship pastor, okay, so the worship pastor provides overall leadership for the congregation, 
for the the team which is made of the band and the singers and uh, and even the you know the others like the media team and the uh, and the audio team etc general direction and hey, this is how we want things to be done uh, for the you know for the sunday service and all that so overall he provides leadership uh, in this area of worship which includes all these people right so we can say okay uh, the worship pastor we can say like maybe seven things we can look at like there could be more but um, uh, we could say seven roles of the worship pastor okay uh, first one is the worship pastor as a priest okay so what does a priest do priest goes before god on behalf of people priest goes before, before people on behalf of god you know traditionally this is what it is when you look at the old testament we see this is what the priest does so the worship pastor as a priest so we see that um, one who represents god to people and one who represents people to god okay, okay. there's a question about any relationship worship with the heart of devotion and gratitude has the transformative power to overcome challenges and draw us close to god uh, is it right some people don't attend worship they give more focus on sermons in the church yeah yes uh, so we are created we are commanded uh, to worship it's what to worship the lord is not an option right um, john chapter 4 verse 23 24 the lord jesus himself said the father is seeking worshipers who will worship in spirit and in truth the psalms are full of exhortations to to praise and to worship the lord and so on so um it's not a you know uh, it's not an option we also know that there are different kinds of different types of worship personal worship something that you do on your own um congregational worship we gather together because the, the lord sees the church as you know each one in the church as a living stones who are gathered together to build up a spiritual house to offer spiritual sacrifices of worship so worshiping as a congregation is actually a spiritual sacrifice that is brought and offered to the lord to congregational worship then having a lifestyle of worship a lifestyle of consecration right a lifestyle of holiness a lifestyle of generosity all these things are seen as a lifestyle of worship right so if people don't attend the time of congregational worship maybe they don't have an understanding of maybe their understanding is only personal worship maybe their understanding is only lifestyle of worship so those are some arguments that people have say okay i worship every day right i i don't have to gather together in order to worship on my own wherever i am i'm worshiping true but the lord also has does something in our midst when people gather together to worship right there is the manifest presence of god that is experienced there is a glory of god that is experienced in corporate worship when we gather together so yeah maybe the people don't maybe they've not got a revelation of it um or understanding of it so maybe that's why okay, okay. right so but the so the worship pastor as a as a priest okay so one who who facilitates one who invites the one who uh to actually helps build a bridge right um to the congregation and the and the people uh, and and god right so as a priest so so we need to understand that all of us are priests unto god okay uh, why do we say that which scripture talks about that all of us are priests first peter sorry which ah uh, that's first peter right first peter i think it's a uh, chapter 2 verse 9 okay so it talks about our identity uh, uh chosen generation a special people um then it talks about a royal priesthood right so so that is very clear right so we are priests unto god then also in revelation right revelation chapter 1 um and verse 6 so it says uh, about jesus 
verse 5 says to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his god and father made us uh, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever okay so we even made us kings and priests so all of us you know we are priests unto god while that may be true right then as a worship pastor you are actually you know you are a priest to all the priests you know maybe we can put it that way where we are simply put we are saying okay i'm pointing you to god i'm you know exhorting you to to come near to draw near to worship god you know as a facility, as a host maybe right so worship pastor as a priest okay so um next class we'll go into more details about the role of the uh worship pastor right we'll stop here okay thank you uh god bless